All right, welcome back to the channel. This is Saiken and today we're going to take a look at another guide for XCOM 2. Today's topic is going to be the top five things I wish I knew before starting XCOM 2. And in order to do that, I decided to change it up and invite a guest of mine. It's my utmost pleasure to welcome Tapcat to the channel. He's a OG to the strategy game uh, sphere and has played XCOM on his channel uh, for many, many iterations. Very pleasant and great runs. So if you haven't checked it out uh, yet, I would um, indulge you to go there. Welcome to the channel, Tapcat. It's great to have you here. Well, thank you for having me and for the kind words. All right, perfect. So shall we go through the top five uh, things? This is part two of the two part series. If you haven't seen part one of this video, it is over at Tapcat's uh, channel with already five things that you should know. And we have decided to use this podcast format in order to go through the other five things. So top five tip for things that I wish I knew before starting XCOM 2 from my side would be understand and be aware of how flashbangs work. Everybody or most of the players would know that flashbangs end mind control and they can even destroy zombies if you flashbang uh, the sector that has created the zombie. But there's also a hidden downside in them that I would like to bring up, which is that it will reduce the hit chance of uh, the sector. As such, the sector has a lower chance to hit, but since the game does not differentiate between the hit roll and the critical hit roll, it effectively means that whenever a flashbang sector is hitting you, you are very likely going to be critted, and that oftentimes at the beginning of the game results in an untimely demise. So really understand when you're supposed to use the flashbangs and just don't throw them out immediately. What's your thought around flashbangs? I like that a lot. Um, by the way, the other thing that flashbangs do that can be really helpful is it cuts down on their mobility as well. I just like within the last week, I've gotten comments on my videos saying that people didn't realize that flashbangs broke mind control or, you know, would kill zombies. So it's very clear that even though maybe some people think that that's obvious and everybody knows it no everybody doesn't know it mm -hmm. and flashbangs are just such great utility especially in the early game uh, but as you said i guess nothing comes without a price and the chance of those crits uh, is the price on this one there's another fun fact i don't know if you knew about that but flashbangs also disable special abilities from many of uh, the enemies so uh, say psionic abilities in general will be disabled for a turn. So that's great against priests, but it will also uh, prevent them from using grenades. And it will also prevent, for instance, uh, the advent captains from using their mark abilities. So if you find yourself uh, with three, four plus targets that are engaged, the flashbangs have a huge radius. And sometimes it is actually quite helpful to use them in order to just disable that uh, special ability, which is going to cause trouble. A viper poison spit, for instance. You know, the other thing that it doesn't happen often, but I've used them. If I was going to have to engage with like multiple pods, a flashbang can be nice because if you kind of know, I can't possibly kill all these guys this turn. Mm -hmm it's a good way to kind of soften up the ones who are left and make them less effective, right? They're less likely to hit you. It's harder for them to flank and on and on. And like you say, it kind of clips their wings as far as their abilities. The flashbang, it really is. It's just a nice all around utility, uh, you know, item. Yeah, I would agree. And it also benefits from uh, the, uh, grenade thrower of the grenadier. So if you increase uh, the uh, the range and also the uh, radius later in the game, it's actually an item that you could even use in mid uh, game and maybe even in late game. Yeah, you're not kidding. If you give that thing to a grenadier, the area of effect goes from being already really good to just insane. Mm -hmm. it, it's so huge. Moving on to the tip number four, which in this case would be overwatch in brackets traps are maybe not as efficient as you might think 
And that might be something that comes counterintuitive to someone who is new to the game. You know, the specifically the stealth mechanic whilst you're concealed might lead towards getting everybody on Overwatch and then breaking your concealment and just waiting for all of the shots to land. And whilst it is true that Overwatch traps can be efficient, I just want to highlight a few things that you should know when you're using them. Specifically, when you're using them out of concealment, Overwatch always has a 20% reduction in the to hit chance. Say, if you had a 100% hit chance, if you go on Overwatch, you only hit 80% of the time. A second topic that you should know about Overwatch is Overwatch shots, unless you do have a specific skill for them, cannot crit. So all of those nice little tail and rounds or modifications to the weapons that will in improve your crit chance, all of that doesn't count really. You will only deal the base damage. And finally, Overwatch has a problem because every single pack will be shot in an order that the enemy determines. So whatever enemy moves first will get shot first. And typically the enemy that moves first is the so-called leader of the pack and that typical captain or whatever enemy is leading that pack oftentimes has the most hit points and is not a very attractive target. So what's your view on that one, Tepket? How do you play an Overwatch trap? This is a great topic. So I totally agree. The target you get isn't always the target you want. It's one of the issues I have with Overwatch in general is that I'm not making the decisions. The game is making the decisions. Mm -hmm. That said, where I think Overwatch is at its best is, how can I say this? You're not replacing things you could have done on your own turn. You're supplementing it, you know? Like, mm -hmm. let's say you put everybody on Overwatch and there's no enemies on the screen yet. So a pod appears, whatever damage you get, that's free basically, right. Right? right? You're not replacing any actions on your own turn. So I love that, but you're right. It's problematic in multiple ways. And even when you're in concealment, and that's the one time, to the best of my knowledge, you don't take the Overwatch aim penalty is if you're doing a concealed ambush. They can't avoid during that and you don't uh, take the penalty, but even then you cannot crit, unfortunately. Right. Yeah. Right. But uh, you're still giving up your choices. So especially as you level up your characters and they start getting more and more abilities, you do need to put real thought into who am I putting on Overwatch and who would I rather save, mm -hmm. right? Because maybe you want to move your Ranger to point blank range and use rapid fire. That's way better. You know, like you just want to think it through. Mm -hmm. Before you go on Overwatch, it's uh, listen, as with so many things in XCOM, it's situational. So I would guess I would I would really say is don't get into a rut of just throwing everybody on Overwatch and calling it good. <laughs> you need to really think about why you're putting each character on and why you might not want to put each character on Overwatch. All right. Yeah, listen, if if we're going to talk about rookie combat, there's uh, so many <laughs> challenges with that, but I'll I'll shut up and let you go to your next point. <laughs> no problem. Maybe we include that into the next one. <laughs> Topic number 3 would be action economy is king. And that might not be immediate clear for someone who has started the franchise, but not all abilities have been created equal. Some of the abilities end your turn, whilst others allow you to use the second ability onwards. And when I'm saying action economy is king, typically the reason why a squad size upgrade in XCOM 2 is so good is because you're getting those extra turns but you can even squeeze out more out of the existing turns that you ever thought would be possible by prioritizing abilities that do not end your turn. A couple of them as examples would be Salvo from the Grenadier, which allows you to lop a grenade and then afterwards take a shot or even a second grenade. Another one could be uh, the Aid Protocol or Revival Protocol or Healing Protocol and then another shot on top of it. So. Effectively, what you're doing with that is if you use those abilities um, properly, then you can get an extra soldier for that um, particular turn. 
Yeah, you made it hard for me to contribute anything meaningful because <laughs> I just agree with literally everything you said. And you nailed the hell out of it. Let, let me let, um, let me ask a question, Tepke, uh, about action economy. How is your stance on reloading, for instance? Because that's uh, something that every single soldier, maybe with uh, the few exceptions, need to do. When do you reload and how often do you do that? Okay, so let's take the easy scenario, which is we're not on a timed mission. Mm -hmm. Every time combat ends, I'm reloading mm -hmm. because I can. But if it's a timed mission, again, it's situational, right? It, there's a, action economy and action efficiency. So mm -hmm. you got to realize that, especially on shorter missions, if there's eight turns, you get 16 actions total for each soldier to get you all the way. That's all the moves, all the shots, <laughs> reloads, grenades thrown, whatever. And so you really don't want to reload if you don't have to. So it's one thing if you have like a ranger or a grenadier that may have abilities that use multiple ammo. If you're down to the threshold where they wouldn't be able to use that ability, you need to reload. Uh, where it gets tricky, though, is, and I'm sure you've encountered this, sometimes you may not actually be at the point where you feel like you need to, but you're at a lull. Like maybe you have mm -hmm. six ammo capacity, you've used four, <laughs> and for say you're specialist, right? Right. Now, do you reload just because you can? Because it's quiet. If you wait until you're in combat, you may not have the action to spare. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't have a hard and fast rule other than if it's not timed, I'll do it every chance I get, whether yeah. I think I need to or not. So go ahead. And I think that is a fantastic uh, way of uh, doing it on the non-timed missions. I do have a principle, which I would call the two ammo principle, specifically for timed missions, because oftentimes I, I know you potentially ran into that situation where you haven't engaged a pack, but you still need to move forward and say you have just had your first firefight and everybody is at less ammo than they started with. And you you reach that critical point where you are maybe having one ammunition in on multiple of your operatives. Now, the problem if you are then going on to Overwatch is you're essentially asking for trouble because if a new pack comes in, you can then not move into a flanking position and shoot. So you're sort of bound in a, into a cover versus cover fight and need to spend the time to reload. So my two ammo pr principle essentially and timed missions came from the fact that it gives you enough time to still be in Overwatch, have that one shot, and then at least have one more round worth of ammunition to meaningfully participate. I agree 100%. The other thing that I'll just throw out there is uh, another way to gain action efficiency is um, prioritizing auto loaders and expanded magazines for really every class because you either reload less with the expanded magazine or you get free reloads with the auto loader. You hit the nail on the head. Auto loaders in particular, I think, are undervalued. If you think about a codex and the codex bomb to hit maybe two, three of your operatives and their clip is just empty, it is so good to move out of that psionic bomb, then reload and pay back. I agree. You know, I used to strongly prefer expanded magazines because occasionally there would be a mission where I would just use all my free reloads. Mm -hmm. Now the auto loader is useless, but the expanded magazine is always doing what it's there to do. Mm -hmm. But what I've realized over time is that those are rarities, whereas things like what you're talking about with the codex, that's common. Like that value I'm getting from the um, auto loader is way more frequent mm -hmm. than the downside. So I do think they're really good. The only thing I will say is there's a one, like maybe for a class like Grenadier, where I personally love chain shot and yeah. I'm constantly using two ammo at a time. I really need an expanded magazine. Having three ammo for that weapon does not work if you're constantly using two at a time. But for most classes, I think the autoloader is really fantastic. 
Anyways, moving on to topic number two, which is my tip is mind shields. Use them and understand what they can bring to the table. I see a lot of failed missions and a lot of failed campaigns by simply not having an opportunity to deal with enemy crowd control. And mind shields are just perfect in War of the Chosen. I have high praise for them. They do not only remove stun and panic, and protect you against most forms of mind control, but they also allow you to counteract certain abilities that you otherwise wouldn't be able to counteract. I give you the example of the Berserker Queen. The moment that she runs into your soldiers and just stuns everybody for two entire turns, that is the moment when you want to smack your face into the keyboard, <laughs> but not so much with a mind shield. So uh, my tip actually would be do not underestimate mind shields and your front lines, specifically Templars and Rangers, can benefit quite a bit from them. Yeah, so I will confess, I I literally never use mind shields. <laughs> okay. But but I'm not saying they're bad. I think for me, what it comes down to is like there are things like mimic beacons and experimental ammunition that I rely a lot upon, and I really want them. And so my difficulty with the mind shield is that I have to give up something to get that, right? Mm -hmm. Now that said, I agree with everything you said. And I think particularly, like if you have to face the warlock or the berserker queen, there's a couple of enemies that really can be way harder if you don't have mind shields. They absolutely bring value. I, I won't scoff at them. I've probably made some missions and campaigns harder than they needed to be because I, I don't actually use them. On that same note, whilst we are at counterplay mechanics, maybe I throw in a bonus and it's not just mind shield, but the point is actually more find ways to, to establish counterplay against what the enemies are doing. And I will use another example of that revival protocol which is a highly underutilized skill just wanted to highlight that if you are finding yourself in trouble with some enemies such as the specter who can uh, shadow bound one of your units revival protocol actually gets them out of it it also allows you to negate panic it even allows you to get rid of disorient which blocks a lot of your special skills so that's an excellent ability. And to the earlier point, it's even one that doesn't end your turn. So, well, I agree with you on that as well. I, I take revival protocol on all of my specialists and uh, I'm a big fan of it. All right, moving on Agreed. to the last point, evacuating missions and fighting another day and not losing soldiers is oftentimes more important than winning the concrete mission at a time. There are only a very few missions that you actually will need to win. Some of which are when you're being, when your Avenger is being shot down or when the, when the doom clock is full and you're effectively forced to invade either a facility, a Skuljek a captain or do the dreaded black side mission. But other than those, the missions can be lost. And if you can get over your ego, keeping the soldiers is actually more valuable than pushing for the mission with a lot of losses. What's your thought around that? Well, I agree that you want to preserve your soldiers' lives. I will admit, though, like this is another one. I don't necessarily uh, follow that as much. So, well, let me let me clarify. Yes, I try to preserve the lives of my soldiers, but I rarely leave a mission early. It's almost like a role playing thing for me as opposed to a pure tactics question. I really adopt the the mentality like I'm there to do this thing and I will do everything I can. I'm probably most apt to back away from that with retaliation missions because I will only move forward to try to rescue civilians at a pace that I can sustain while keeping my soldiers alive, mm -hmm. if possible. Be okay with <laughs> failing those from time to time is what I'm hearing. Yeah, absolutely. And I've had other missions where, like, I had a protect the device mission where I think it was a sectopod firing at it from turn one. And my reaction was, <laughs> well, I guess I've lost this one. And uh, amazingly, I actually won and I didn't lose anybody, but I, I'm not sure to this day how I managed it. 
But my point is like, no, I won't run face first into a spinning blade, you know, to try and win the mission. But I will do my best to keep moving forward and win as long as I think that's a realistic outcome. Now, you in particular, like you take on such crazy challenges where you'll say, you know, I can't fire any guns for the whole campaign or something like that. You have got to take that approach if you're going to do that. If you're playing a vanilla campaign, you shouldn't have that many situations where you genuinely need to cut and run. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think that if you work the problem, you should have a real chance to win. But I, I, I don't want to sound like I'm going against your core point because I agree with it. Don't piss the lives of your soldiers away. And for that matter, it's really bad if you end up with like three or four guys in the hospital for the next month. Yeah, that could uh, bite you very much in, in the rear. And I think you nailed it, that it all comes down to the situation and your judgment. The challenge there is that that judgment comes over hundreds of hours of playing the game. And I was putting <laughs> myself in the situation of, say, if you're playing it for the first time, and Bradford is in your ear saying, you got to move forward, you got to move forward. Commander, the aliens continue to make progress on the Avatar project. If we're going to slow them down, we'll need to move fast. And you get tunnel visioned into thinking, I need to do this mission, elsewise I'm losing the game. Whilst in reality, oftentimes the consequences of losing a mission are not as severe of course once you get more experience like you were saying you can try to push it at a reasonable pace but many of the restarts of XCOM 2 kind of boil down to a story of it was okay the first two or three missions and then a full squad wipe happened and I'm always asking mm -hmm. myself well that that thing is not falling from the sky a full uh, squad wipe means you actually were staying there until the very 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 end and the point was more so to that if you lose a soldier and you know that it's unrealistic to win uh, the mission, just don't take that many more injuries. If you can get a couple of kills and experience, great. And even if you can w win the mission, even better, but don't feel too bad by just not completing the mission. I think that that would be a more fair way of expressing it. Yeah, I will say, especially in the early game, when you only have four people in the squad, if you lose even one, it's going to be really tough to win. And if you lose two, there's no point sticking around. Get the hell out. I think the harder question is, what do you do if you haven't lost anybody, but most of them are wounded? Early game, you have four or five health, and they're all like down by three, let's say. Mm -hmm. nobody, Nobody's dead, but you're one shot away. Like each soldier is basically one hit away from dying. That's tricky. Right. Because you that could turn into a squad wipe real quick. Correct. Absolutely. So, you know, maybe you have to think about do I stay or do I go at that point for sure. And this brings us to the end of today's podcast. A couple of questions remain. Number one, did you enjoy the new format? If so, let us know in the comments down below. Number two, did you agree with the points in the top five things that you should know? And number three, most importantly, if you want to see more of Tabcat, feel free to click the link down below in the doobly-doo and give his channel a visit. Thank you so much for being here, Tabcat. Really enjoyed the time with you. Take care.